Hello, listeners. Mallory Wilsey here, chief producer of the Enrollify Network. So everyone is talking about AI these days, but not enough people are taking the time to unpack how AI will impact the future of higher education. And that's why we launched the Generation AI podcast, co-hosted by Artis Kadu, CEO of Element 451, and JC Bonilla, Chief Data Officer at Vayner Media. Artis and JC have worked on large language models for nearly two decades and have remarkable technical knowledge around how they work and how generative AI will impact the future of higher ed. Generation AI isn't just about understanding artificial intelligence. It's about being part of the AI revolution in education. Tune in, get informed, and be inspired to innovate in your educational space with the power of artificial intelligence. You can subscribe to the show by visiting podcast.enrollify.org or just search Generation AI wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, I'm a higher ed CMO and I have a confession to make. There's actually something a little bit interesting to me about marketing on a shoestring. That's not to say that I wouldn't prefer to have, you know, the biggest budget in the world to work with. But when you have a shoestring budget, you really have to be creative. You really have to think outside the box. And you really have to think deeply about who your students are and what type of institution you are and how you can best serve those students and how you can attract those students. So I am thrilled to be having my friend, Bart Kaler, who is the president of Kaler Solutions on the podcast at this episode to talk a little bit about his book, Chasing Mission Fit, which really dives into how small and niche institutions can market themselves to attract just the perfect students to their institutions. So I hope you enjoy. Welcome to Confessions of a Higher Ed CMO, a podcast that empowers higher ed marketers to bring innovation, creativity, and excellence to their work. I'm your host, Jamie Hunt. Join me every two weeks for discussions with some of the best minds in higher education marketing. Confessions of a Higher Ed CMO is part of the Enrollify Network, a robust collection of podcasts designed to help higher educational professionals like you grow. Explore our other shows at enrollify.org or check out some of my personal favorites linked in the show notes below. Enrollify is made possible by Element 451, the leading AI-powered all-in-one student engagement platform, helping institutions create meaningful, personalized, and engaging interactions with students. Learn more at element451.com. One of the best things about working in higher ed is getting to meet wonderful people that can become your friends. And I'm really thrilled to have one of those people here with me today. And that's Bart Kaler, who's the president of Kaler Solutions and the author of Chasing Mission Fit. Hey, Bart, how are you? I'm doing well. Thanks, Jamie. It's good to be here. I'm so happy to have you here. Before we jump into talking a little bit about your book, Chasing Mission Fit, can you tell us a little bit about your higher ed journey? I'm a first generation college student and so am, and I am also the oldest in my family. And so growing up and and going into high school, I I knew that I wanted to go to college, but I, I just didn't know how to get there. I mean, I, there was a local college in the town that I lived in and a regional college, the town next over. And so uh, that was my world. (laughs) I mean, I I didn't know much beyond that. I'd even toyed with, you know, going into the service to do ROTC or something. And I remember, I mean, that's that's a fine route and I'm not trying to discount that, but I remember one of my uh, math teachers saying, no, no, you don't need to do that. You've got other options. And I didn't know that. I mean, my dad worked at the factory and I just knew that we weren't going to be able to afford what I thought we needed. And so long story short, I came home my senior year of high school and my mom had left a... uh, a newspaper on the on the counter and circled a, an article about a friend of the family who'd gotten a, a presidential scholarship at Anderson University. And she said, you need to call about this because I had good grades and, and I was a, a pretty good student. And so 
I, uh, I treated it like it was a job interview. And I, I remember calling the admissions department. I, I didn't know what I was doing. And I, I called and said, uh, can I come over and talk to somebody over Christmas break and, and, uh, and learn more about this? And so, I mean, I put my suit on like I was going on a job interview. Uh-huh. I mean, it ended up being a, a visit, <laughs> but I didn't know any better. <laughs> yeah. And ended up asking if I could talk to the uh, admissions director and basically sold them on why I think I should get a scholarship. And I mean, and so looking back at it, I laugh at that now because I, I know how it works and I, I've been doing higher ed marketing for a while, but, uh, I was very fortunate to, to be able to afford to go to that school with, you know, I was part of the first uh, class of presidential scholars and I actually met my wife at the, uh, at the dinner. She also oh, received nice. it and we ended up sitting at the same table with our family. So that's how we actually met. So, um, so yeah, my, my journey to higher ed was, uh, was, was kind of a unique one. And then the impact that it had on, on not only myself, but my wife, who's also first gen and just the trajectory that we see that our lives are different than, than other members of our family. It's, it's quite humbling. And so that's part of why I get so passionate about higher ed. I love talking to other first generation college graduates. Like I think there's a special spot for higher ed in our lives. Like mm-hmm. it made our lives possible. And we recognize that I think at a level that folks that come from more generational college graduates mm-hmm. maybe don't really appreciate. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is something that I think drives a lot of us. Absolutely. So you recently came out with Chasing Mission Fit that came out in February. Mm-hmm. Tell me a little bit about what inspired you to write that. Partly was the podcast, you know, my podcast, uh, you know, The Higher Ed Marketer, which you've been on on as well. As I started, you know, learning more and gaining more insight and started forming my own opinion. I mean, I've, I've been in, in marketing for my entire career. I've been in higher ed marketing. I did my first higher ed website in 1997, 98. Wow. And so I have been doing, you know, higher ed in one form or another, along with corporate work and other things. But I, um, I started kind of forming my own opinions in the last four or five years. And, and then I started working with a lot of smaller schools, small to medium sized schools. And some of these schools that I was working with or running into, they would, they would ask for my help and, you know, they, they might have 25 students or 50 students and they're kind of very mission driven. A lot of them are faith-based schools and, um, they just couldn't afford a lot of the work that, I mean, I couldn't afford to work with them. And so I thought, boy, it'd be a great for, for me to be able to figure out a way that I could kind of take what I know and make it in a way that they could, you know, follow some instructions. Yeah. And so that's kind of what, you know, the, the idea behind uh, chasing mission fit was, was how could I take what I've learned over the course of my career and distill it down into something that, you know, could help people avoid overspending or, putting resources in the wrong spots. And a lot of times they'll, they'll hear a board member say, you know, I've got a, a car dealership and we just put billboards up and everybody yeah. figures out and comes. And why aren't we doing that for the school? And they're, they're always feeling the pressure to get out there. You know, the board says, we don't, we don't see anything about, you know, why aren't you marketing? And it's like, well, we're marketing this way. So there was just that going on. And so I just really decided that I wanted to kind of put it down on paper and, and, and get it out there uh, as a resource. That's awesome. And it is truly, I feel like, a roadmap for marketing. Like, it, it just really lays out what you need to know, what you need to do without, like, a lot of extraneous content. Yeah. Like, it's it's a really tight, really, really well done book. Thank you. We tried to be very pragmatic. I mean, if anybody knows me or listens to the podcast, that's kind of my mantra. It's, hey, it's great. Let's talk about it. But now what are we going to do? Yeah, absolutely. So what is a mission fit student? And how do you recommend schools approach identifying those students? So I think um, the first step that I lay out in the book that I think anyone could do is if you're if you're a marketer at a school, you need to understand what's your school about. Um, I, I think it's too easy to say, well, we're just like her and we try to compare ourselves to something else. Mm-hmm. And I think it's 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 worth the exercise to go through and understand what is the unique, you know, uh, the, the the distinctives about your school. You know, what, what are those things that only you can do that, that the world would be without if your school didn't exist? Once you identify that, now you can say, there's a lot of people in the world that want that. The problem is, is they just don't know that we have what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. And so when I talk about mission fit, I'm talking about who is that student that maybe not know about you, or maybe doesn't understand you fully, 
that boy, if they ended up at your school, they would excel. They would be the, you know, they would enjoy it. They would have the best experience and then they would go and tell other people about it. Mm -hmm. That's what I define as a mission fit student is someone who is going to fit so well with who you are already that it's just going to be, it's like a magnet. It's, Mm -hmm. it's a natural draw. And so I think what happens is that we get into this mistake that we have to fill the, the class. And so let's just you know, start ringing the bell and trying to get everybody in the door. And, and, you know, there's different strategies of that, but a lot of times what happens is that we get so many apps in the funnel of students who are like, yeah, that's my third, fifth, seventh right. choice. And we don't really focus on going after the mission fit students. And so we're so thin on all the work that we're doing that we can't build the relationships with the ones that are really going to succeed. And it just suffers all the way around. And so that's, that's how I kind of define the mission fit student. I think that's so wise. I I think about um, my time at Winston-Salem State and how we really narrowed in on A, talking about what our mission is and who we are and what what we stand for and how that's different from some of the other, um, that's Winston-Salem State's an HBCU, what Mm -hmm. some of the other HBCUs have to offer. And um, we saw such a big jump in the percentage of students who said we were a first choice after we got really good at yeah. talking about who we are and what we mean. Um, our motto, Enter to Learn, Depart to Serve, was we were really trying to attract those students who were interested in a social justice mission, mm-hmm. who wanted to do things with their major, do things with their career that yep. made the world better. And once you once you flip that switch, I feel like you can't really go wrong. You get the apps that are going to yield. Yep. You get the students who are going to be successful. That helps your retention rate, your graduation rate, all of that. Everything goes up when you can get that right. And, and I think part of it, like you just said, you had to do the internal branding exercise to figure that out, who you were. Mm-hmm. But then you have to create the external personas personas to actually be able to know who is it that's the best recipient of that, that message. And so uh, we just finished a persona exercise for one of our clients. And, and uh, it, it takes a lot of work. I think sometimes people think, oh, we're just going to you know, copy and paste some, some uh, stock photos of photos and name them and a few things. It takes some work to actually get it right that matches who you are to match with what students are looking for. And so, uh, so yeah, I think that's one of the ways that you can kind of align correctly with that. Do you get any sort of pushback when you work with schools about taking this approach versus like what I'd call the shotgun approach where you just like, we just want all the apps? I've heard a little bit of both because I think that some schools have kind of, uh, they've kind of gotten addicted to the, all the apps. I mean, when the common app came out and, and, and some of the other ones that are available now where it's super easy for students to just be able to check a box or click a box where, you know, all of a sudden they're applying to 37 schools and they know six of them. Right. And, um, and, and so I think I, I get a little pushback sometimes where people are kind of scared because it feels like a safety blanket. It's like, what do you mean, you know, we can't have all these apps or, or we start down a mission fit, you know, campaign and they start hyperventilating in, in September because the numbers are flat on apps or they're, or they're nowhere near where they were the year before. And they've getting, they're getting ready to do the fall board meeting. And they're like, what am I going to say? And I'm like, well, point to the deposits, point to the things that are, we are seeing, you know, we're up double from deposits last year. Well, what about the apps? I'm like, well, if we're doing our work correctly, don't worry about the apps because it's all going to come out. We're, we're talking about yield. We're focused on the right students who are going to come all the way through. And so, yeah, you'll see some pushback on that. And I think a lot of times the pushback ultimately comes from the board. And, and a lot of times it's an educated board. It's an, a board who, you know, a lot of times the smaller schools, they, they have a mixed bag of different board members that are either there because they're, you know, part of a, a faith tradition that, that, you know, requires a certain percentage of them to be there or, or other means. And I think that they come well-intentioned, but sometimes, like I used the example of the car dealership, they, they expect a certain kind of marketing that they're used to as a general consumer, as opposed to how would you really attract the student that's really going to fit? Billboards are the thing. Like that is what <laughs> boards want. They want billboards and airport ads and yeah. that kind of stuff. Like it's, I was talking to a, a, a client today and, and we were talking about it as, as a new consulting client that I'm working with. And I was just trying to get an idea of where things stood. And she was like, you know, I, I probably spend 10 to 15% of my marketing budget just on things to appease the board so that they don't ask me questions. hundred percent. I've been there. She, she's I've like, been I, there. I've got bus billboards. I've got billboards. I've got, 
you know, uh, transit stops that I know are doing nothing for me because that's, that's not where my students are, but the board sees them and, and they all feel good about the marketing we're doing. Hey all, I hope you're enjoying this episode of Confessions of a Higher Ed CMO. I want to take a moment to thank my friends at MindPower who are making season two of this Enrollify podcast possible. MindPower is a full service marketing and branding firm celebrating nearly 30 years of needle moving, thought provoking, research fueled creative and strategy. MindPower is woman founded and owned, WBENC certified, nationally recognized, and serves the social sector, higher education, healthcare, nonprofits, and more. The MindPower team is made up of strategists, storytellers, and experienced creators. From market research to brand campaigns to recruitment to fundraising, the agency exists to empower clients, amplify brands, and help institutions find a strategic way forward. You can learn more about their work in the world by heading on over to MindPower Inc. That's M I N D P O W E R I N C dot com. And be sure to tell the crew that Jamie sent you their way. I have a, a friend who was at an institution that wanted her to pivot a big chunk of her, like half her budget into print ads, like newspaper ads. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Like, and when have you seen a 16 year old look at the newspaper? When have you seen a 65 year old look at the newspaper? I, when have you matter? seen a newspaper? I mean, that's the right. thing. It's like I, the newspapers <laughs> I see are like the, you know, two or three pages now instead of the big fat ones that they used to be. So, yeah, it breaks my heart as a formal journalist. But yeah, yeah. At, at the same time, it's like that's not where the kids are. No. We've kind of talked about this. I think we both have a passion and, a, and an interest in these smaller schools that are kind of pressed for pressed for cash and having to really stretch their right. budgets, market on a shoestring. And you have this whole chapter in the book dedicated to the fallacy that more money equals better marketing. And I agree with you, but I would love to hear more <laughs> about that. I think that's one of the problems is that a lot of times I'll go into these small schools and and we'll talk about things. And it's a little bit of, uh, you know, the violin start and the woe is me. It's like, oh, if we just had a bigger budget, we could do something. And I'm like, okay, well, tell me how you're spending the budget. And it's like, well, you know, we're working with the local cable company to do our pay-per-click ads. And I'm like, do they know what they're doing? Right. So, <laughs> right. So I and feel it, you. And I'm at, and I start asking them questions and they're like, um, I don't know. Let's Let's get them on the phone. And when I get the salesperson of the cable company on the phone, they're tap dancing. <laughs> and, I, and I start asking just some simple questions. I'm like, what kind of conversions are we getting? Oh, it's going great. We're getting like 150 conversions a month. I'm like, are you talking about conversions into students? Or are you talking about somebody clicking and paying for an ad? And they're like, pick clicking and paying for an ad. And then the client is like, what? I thought they were students. Uh, <gasps> no, it's like, and so you have a lot of this, you know, people just don't understand what they're buying. Yeah. And, and so when you start looking at that and I'm like, okay, you have a budget, but you're spending it in a very poor way because you don't know what you're buying mm -hmm. and you've just spent $250,000 last year on getting, you know, one student to apply. Oh God. I said, that's a very high cost <laughs> of <Yes>. a lead. <laughs> yes, and, and so when they start unpacking it, it's like, oh, well, what should we do? And so then we start educating them and saying, okay, here's what it means when you're buying pay-per-click advertising. The conversion is how much it costs when you click and they land on a page. Hopefully they land on a landing page and not just your homepage like they have been doing for the last four years with the cable company because nobody knew any better and they're outsourcing it to the Philippines just to make their buck. And, um, and so we start talking about how to do it differently and how to you know, do the budgeting differently and how to put it into different buckets. Let's try pay-per-click. Let's try, you know, some guerrilla tactics. Let's look at watering holes where these other students might be that are your mission fit students. And let's figure out creative ways to get in front of them because they're, they're Gen Z and coming up on Gen Alpha and their attention span is very, very small. We've got to stop the scroll. And, and how are we going to do that? And, you know, just having a, an Instagram post about, you know, don't forget financial aid is not going to do it. We, we've got to entertain them. And so we kind of get in to start looking at what are the creative ways that we can do it on a low budget, high creativity to try to make an impact as opposed to just thinking that, well, let's ask the board for another $250,000 because that $250,000 isn't doing what we thought it should. Well, take a look at what you're spending before you start, you know, feeling like you need to spend more money. Your story about the local cable company just like hit me like you punched me in the chest because I've been the person that's come in and seen that that's what we're doing and been like, 
what is happening here? And I've been so lucky to have some really great um, digital marketing leadership that I've been able to hire that have come in and really held those agencies and putting that kind of an air quote because it's the local cable company <laughs> to their feet to the fire on what the heck are you calling a conversion? Yeah. Like you're bragging about all these conversions um, and we got zero apps. Yeah. I what? mean, if it's the cable company or if it's the radio stations or if it's the TV station, all these places that are traditional broadcast, their advertising dollars have dried up. So they're trying to find ways to underscore and stay in business. And so that's what they're going after where the ball's bouncing. They don't know what it is though. And uh, I mean, that that's such a sad story, but I think I've had that happen three times in the last two years where I'll walk into a school and learn $250,000, a million dollars, a million point five is being spent on this. And they've been doing it for five years and they're like, oh, we didn't know that's what a conversion was. And I'm like, oh my God, shame on the cable company, yeah. shame on you. Let's let's get some literacy in all this. Well, I had um, somebody tell me that they had reporting that lagged by months after the end of a campaign. They were not getting <laughs> weekly reports or any sort of report over the course of the campaign. They were getting reports like two months after the campaign was done. And you can't do anything about it. I mean, why, why even do the report? Right. And and then the, I remember one person said to me, um, they told me that oh, it looks like maybe you we weren't sending to the most optimized landing page. So that's probably why there weren't a lot of, you know, apps driven from this. And and she was like, you didn't tell me that. You let this campaign run for six months mm -hmm. without ever telling me that I needed to do something with yeah. the landing page. And and you really can't just sit, set and forget digital marketing. No. But I get it when you're a one-man band or you're, you know, a very small shop that that sometimes that's what you feel like you have to do but come on yeah you've if you're going to spend that kind of money you, you've got to prioritize the time that it's going to take it's it's not a sit and forget it as much as google will try to tell you that it is or you know all the tools are designed to make them money and so they can be used and they can be used well, but you really have to have somebody know what they're doing. I mean, I used to try to help some clients do some things on my own, like 10 years ago, 12 years ago. And I was like, this is a lot of work. I, I don't know what I'm doing because I have all these other things to do. So I brought a couple partners in freelancers to help me. And then I was like, I just don't feel good about that. I ended up partnering with another firm that that's all they do. And they've mm -hmm. got a team of like 12 people that just sit on Facebook all day and tweak and monitor. And I'm like, okay, you guys can take care of all that. I will offer your services in conjunction with mine, but I just never felt comfortable about, I just felt like I was laying in bed at night thinking about all the money that's being spent while I'm sleeping. Right. <laughs> right. Like, that's not, I just didn't, I couldn't, I couldn't be comfortable with that. So good for you. I, I feel like the value of a really strong digital marketer cannot be overstated. No. Like uh, when, but when you're talking to somebody who maybe wants to make an investment, what recommendations do you give to them about finding a company that will give them what they need if maybe they can't afford, and I'm not going to name drop, but you know, right. some places I've gotten quotes as high as a 40% upcharge for right. digital advertising. Maybe they can't afford that. I think the first thing that you do before you start even talking to companies is get up to speed yourself, R read some books, listen to podcasts, do some research, watch some YouTube videos, get the very basics so that you know what questions to ask and answer, even if it has to be, you know, after hours or on the weekend. I mean, a lot of us are learning AI and we're doing it after hours and on the weekend. Mm -hmm. um, it, it would, I mean, it wouldn't take better part of two weekends to be able to just kind of get a free Google account, you know, and, and put $15 in and just try your own thing. And just so you can get a sense of what's going on and how it works, at least have a, an, a, a bit that you can do that. And then you can also even just, um, if, if you do have somebody that you're working with or you're saying, hey, can you show me some data that you've done before or or even just go to chat GPT and say, Hey, I'm thinking about interviewing a you know digital marketing firm for higher education. What are seven questions I should be asking them and explain them to me in a way that a third grader could understand. I mean, something like that. I mean, those are tools that I'm starting to use too. I mean, I, I was with a client that, you know, I got engaged and it's one of those times where there's already parties involved and I'm coming in as a little bit of a fractional CMO. And it's like, okay, they've got, here's our digital agency. They, they want to meet with you. And, you know, they're doing their tap dance and routine. And, 
and, you know, throwing stuff over the wall. And so I just went into chat GPT and said, you know, what are 10 things I need to be looking for and asking them that, that will tell me if they're experts or not. And so it gave me a list of 10 questions. I copied, put that in an email to them. They struggled to, to answer some of them. And so that was my first flag. Mm. And so it, it was, it was that type of thing that, you know, I, I read it and I knew enough to understand that these are fair questions. But I, I started to start to wonder if they knew as much as they claimed to or that the client claimed that they knew. And so um, it's, I think you have to really educate yourself and your team. Having a digital expert on, on staff or as a partner will help, but it comes down first to knowing what you're buying. I mean, yeah. none of us would go out and buy a brand new car just by, you know, w- walking into the first, you know, dealership that we passed and, and just said, you know, I'll take that yellow one over there. Right. You would do a little bit of research or you would at least understand what it costs, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> how many miles it has and, right. and you know, if it runs. Uh, right. and, and so I, I think that we've got to kind of keep in mind just if, you know, we, we tend to run away from things we don't understand and we just, we live in a world that we can't afford to do that anymore. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. So you have a whole chapter that discusses marketing on a shoestring. What do you recommend for institutions that have really, really small scale budgets? The first thing I like to do is I like to step back and say, once we identify who your mission fit student is, you know, so let's say, let's just use an example of they're a a small, you know, Bible college or something. And so we know that that student is going to be interested in studying the Bible. More than likely, that student's going to be in watering holes that are going to be understandable. So Mm -hmm. guess what? They might be in a church someplace. So that all of a sudden becomes a target watering hole that we want to go after. It's the same thing if I'm at a small engineering school. Guess what? Those students are probably looking at YouTube videos about how to make stuff. Mm. So why don't we go where that watering hole is, is where they're over there watching YouTube videos about how to make things or do 3D printing or going to these 3D print repositories where they can download things that they can print out on their 3D printers. So kind of stopping and taking an inventory of who are our students that are going to really fit and then where do they hang out and then go figure out how you can hang out with them, not just put ads there because you can do ads there and that's fine, but how can you actually hang out with them? And if there are gatekeepers in that area, so going back to the engineering example, more than likely they're in a, in a STEM club at high school and a lot of them are participating in, in, um, you know, organizations like project, uh, lead the way, which is a, a big, uh, uh, STEM organization in a lot of high schools. Figure out how you can either partner with the gatekeepers or the influencers to get access into those students. Maybe you're going to science fairs and you're doing special events and, and you know, pro- sponsoring those things. You've got to really start to get creative in the way that you're doing it. And I know that takes a lot more work and it takes a lot more ideation. And that's what you know AI is for sometimes. Mm-hmm. But I think that it, it has to start with you have to kind of get in the mind of your mission fit students by defining them and defining yourself and then start figuring out where are they at, where where's their natural watering holes and go figure out how to infiltrate that. And so it, it's it's a different approach than looking at it from a just get the word out. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, I think that, you know, brand awareness is one way that you can do marketing and that's putting the billboards up. We've talked about that. But then if you're going to truly do lead generation, it's it's kind of like the difference between, you know, there's different kinds of fishing. You can do trawling, which is you know, those big industrial fishing where they throw a net out and they just drag along the bottom of the ocean and grab everything and everything that that's what a lot of big flagship schools can do because they need to get the word out for everybody. But smaller schools, you have to kind of almost approach it like you're a fly fisherman. You've got Mm -hmm. to measure the weather. You've got to understand the season. You've got to understand what's happening on the water, understand the temperature, understand exactly the right bait that you're going to need and and aim and cast right into that little hole. It takes a lot more skill and a lot more effort, but the yield that you're going to get out of that is a lot stronger and better than, you know, having to sort through everything else. And it's a lot cheaper. And a lot of those flagship schools have two things that no small school has. They have a football team and they have a medical school. And Uh you that that's worth millions, millions of of advertising dollars. Because every when you have a medical school, every clinic, every you have news stories about the medical advances that are coming out of your medical school. You have And most of the time the brand is right on the on the hospital, it's on the bills, it's on everything. Yep. Yeah. And then football, I don't even need to explain why that's, no, that's no. a winning combination. And, and most of them will have 
hundreds of thousands or millions of alumni. Yes. That are, you know, bleeding the school colors every weekend. And and yes. so it's a different ball game. And that's that's why I talk in the book a lot about stop looking at the big school. Yes. Stop comparing yourself and trying to do what they're doing because you're in a different league. You cannot do that. Right. And just accept who you are and try to figure out other ways to do it. I mean, just think about you know, Virginia Tech, for an example. Um, my husband was the director of alumni communications there. So I think he said at that time there was like 290,000 living alumni. That's, that's, um, that's, that's the better part of a half a million people. It's more than a quarter million people who are, and those Hokies bleed maroon and orange. I mean, there are people I've been, I've been in States far away from Virginia where you're seeing hokey license plates and hokey bumper stickers and hokey everything. That's all billboards for your school that a small school, even if you are a fantastic football team or whatever, you don't have a half million of these things all out in the world, these little mini billboards for your institution all over the world. I mean, most small schools, 25,000 living alumni. 30,000. Right. Right. That's, I mean, they can usually tell how many, you know, alumni magazines they send out. That's, I mean, that's what they're doing. And yeah. so, yeah, it's a different ball game and we've got to treat it like it's a different ball game. And one thing I would love to get your take on this. Um, when I was at a, a small institution, when we leveraged those alumni in different ways, like we really tried to engage them with social media and we tried to gauge them with like some surgical precision with these are some of our target students can we get you into those schools to give presentations? Can we get you in front of those students in some capacity? If you have a kid in a school, can you have like a, I'm going to come and talk to your your class and, and talk about Winston-Salem State where you're there. All of these things where it's, you can expand the breadth of your marketing team by activating your alumni. Yeah, I think that's a brilliant idea. And it ends up being relationship building as well, mm-hmm. because I mean, a lot of times, Alumni want to give back and, and they need to be able to have options to give back instead of just the year end giving appeal or the you know day of giving Tuesday that they're going to do. I mean, giving them other opportunities to say, hey, here's what's going on in enrollment. We would love your help on this. Do you know any students? Do you know, you know the things that you just talked about? Mm-hmm. I think that's a brilliant way because they want to give back to their school yeah. and uh, giving them more options is a great way to do it. Hey, it's Mallory. Exciting news. I'm hosting the Engage Summit in Raleigh on June 25th and 26th, and I'd love to meet you there. Together, we'll dive into the mind of the modern student, what fires them up, how they interact, and what they expect in today's digital age, and how tools like AI help put them in the driver's seat of their education. We have some terrific speakers, including our closing keynote, New York Times bestselling author, Jeff Salingo. Sessions will dig into practical ideas and innovative strategies to get your team more student-centered and ready to adopt AI. And many of your favorite Enrollify hosts are presenting too, like Jamie Hunt, Jenny Lee Fowler, and Brian Gross. Use the discount code Enrollify50 for an extra $50 off your registration. Learn more and register at engage.element451.com. We can't wait to see you there. One thing we did that I think every school should steal because it's great um, was get our alumni um, activated around the days that we were releasing decisions. So mm. it'd be like we're releasing decisions and we're, we've asked our students to share that they're, they got in on social media. But then we want our alumni to say, welcome to the Ram family. Yep. Look welcome for to this the Ram family. hashtag. Yep. yep. That's awesome. I love that. That's a, that sh- everybody should be doing that. So take a note. <laughs> so we kind of touched on this with the last last question I had, but um, you specifically posit that big brand campaigns are not necessary for all schools. I agree, mm-hmm. to completely agree. But tell me more about your thoughts on that. So what I define a big brand campaign, and it goes back to my illustration at the beginning about the board, is that everybody and everybody knows about the campaign. I mean, if I had a dollar for every time a school says, you know what, Bart, we're the best kept secret. We just can't be that way. (laughs) 
<laughs> I would be able to retire now. I wouldn't yes. take, you know, I'd be done. The, the fact is, is that yes, you are the best kept secret, but getting the word out to everybody and anybody is not the way to go about it. Um, I've, I've worked with a little tiny school. Um, I'm not even going to say where they are, but it's just a little tiny rural school. And they're kind of in between about three or four larger cities. And they just have this great opportunity. And one of the board members is like, you know, I've got the tractor dealership in town and we just put, we just, we have a great ad agency. They get us all kinds of clients and stuff. And it's like, we're not going after farmers. Uh, You know, we're not looking for that potential student. And so just getting the word out, I don't think is necessary. Getting the word out to the watering holes is necessary. Mm -hmm. And if you want to call that a big brand campaign, that's one way to look at it. But I had a school recently that was going to be attending a large uh, conference in in Louisville, Kentucky. It was a it was a large religious conference, and they were a seminary, and they were like, you know, they don't have any money. I mean, they they have like twenty five students. They're a startup. They're just trying to get started. And we found out that there's a way that um, there's a couple websites that will sell excess digital billboard space. Oh. And so there was a billboard on the outside of the convention center in Louisville, and I looked it up, and they could actually rent the billboard and be in between the other advertisers probably show up once, you know, once every you know five minutes for four days. Um, and it cost them $37. What? And, <laughs> and so that's an example of getting creative and trying to figure out ways to do something that's going to make an impact because I didn't need the entire town of Louisville to see it. I didn't need, you know, everybody on, on the interstate driving by to see it. I only needed this 9,000 people that were going to be going in and out of that convention center through those doors where the billboard was above. I only needed those people to see it. That's yeah. all I cared about. Yeah. And so being able to get hyper-focused and, you know, th- the digital billboard, all they care about is selling the pixels. Right. They don't, they don't care if you're there for, I mean, most of these companies that we found, you could buy as minimum as, uh, you know, an hour's worth of space. You know, the minimum charge was like $10 wow. and, um, and, and all you have to do is upload your JPEG or your GIF and they'll just run it for you. Definitely. It's all done. It's all done through a, a website. And so, um, it's ideas like that. That's out of the box thinking it's like, okay, billboard. No, but yes. I mean, yeah. that's one of those situations where I'd say, no, that was the right billboard to do. Yeah. Um, and the whole way I found that is it, while I was working on the book, you know, in my Instagram feed, somehow it must have heard me talk about my book. <laughs> right. So it started serving up things about the book. And somebody had a feed that said, you know, buying a billboard was the best move I've ever made when I published my book. And I was like, what in the world is that about? And so it was the clickbait. So I, I watched it and it was not an ad for this company, but they said, yeah, I went, I went with this company and I bought a billboard for one hour. And I went out and had my friend take pictures of me in front of the billboard. And I did a social media campaign around being on the billboard. Nobody knows that she paid, you know, $37 for an hour in front of it because on social media, you can do that. I've seen a few people do that with like Times Square where they rented the billboard for an hour, they do all their social media, and then they run that campaign on social media for months. And you're like, wow. Yep. They must be really big because they're on they're on Times Square, yep. and and that's what you're using it for. But you're doing it in a creative guerrilla tactic way. I have a model friend. My husband and I used to own a photography studio, and we worked mm-hmm. with a lot of models who um, somehow got bought a space in Times Square for it was like the one shot of her long enough for her to get a picture. And that was in like 2012. And she still talks about it. Like it's on her like portfolio site, like in the Times Square, I was on an advertisement in Times Square. No parenthetical sink that I paid for, (laughs) for one minute. Yeah. But it's, it's that thing where I think that there's, there's capital involved in those things. It, It stops the scroll. It has people sit up and look. Yeah. That's what we're trying to do in this busy, crowded attention, you know, space. And so that's where, you know, that's where I look at it and say, big brand campaigns are not necessary, but you need to be big brand in front of your audience. That's, that's so, so smart. And when you were talking about this sort of niche billboard, I was thinking, you know, think outside the box about where billboards are located too. You know, if there's a billboard in, um, that's right outside of a high school that is, you know, is a target high school for your, or a good feeder school for your campus, you know, that might be an ideal billboard Oh yeah. versus the one that you're paying umpteen times more that's on a busy interstate. 
you know the people coming past that billboard at twice, you know, in and out every single day are literally your target yeah. audience. Yeah. So, so, so creative is what you need to be. I sounded like Yoda there tonight. <laughs> I'm so creative you need to be. <laughs> So you're talking about, you know, not all these smaller or niche schools need to be doing these sort of quote unquote big brand campaigns. How does a school kind of decide whether or not they fall into that category? <laughs> I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, where are your institutional goals? I mean, I, you know, you, you get to a point where at some level when you are starting to do like, you know, professional and graduate level type stuff where you do have to kind of get your name out there, especially if you're going to, if you're going to be competing with an MBA, it's, I mean, you can have a lead message to lead with, this is our kind of MBA and this is why it's going to be different. And you're going to find your mission fit students that way, but that's still going to be a little bit more of a broader play than, than some of the smaller niche things that I've talked about. So it, a lot of it depends on the offerings that you're doing and the types of programs that you're trying to fill. Um, and, and the demand of those programs. I mean, certainly like nursing and, and some of the other things, those are going to be a little bit more broad appeal um, than some of the ones that I've used as an illustration, whether it's engineering or some of the faith-based things. But um, I don't know if there's like, if you're over this amount of students, then do this because I right. don't think that's the way to do it. But I think it has more to do with what kind of programs, what are the goals that you're trying to achieve? How are you doing that? And then what is your budget? I mean, a lot of it comes down to the budget. I mean, if, if you yeah. if you're already on a very small budget, it's just not going to make a lot of financial stewardship sense to go out there and try to do something big. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, even if you're told we need to make a big splash, that might be the last thing you do is make a big splash. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so I that's a good question, but I'm not sure I have a definitive answer. Again, I try to be so pragmatic, but I want to give somebody an answer. But yeah. it, it depends. Yeah. That, well, that makes sense. When you are talking to schools about aligning their marketing strategies with their institutional values and culture, I think there's that challenge of some institutions don't know who they are. Yeah. What can you um, tell those marketers about helping their institutions discover that? Um, sometimes there's exercises that you can do. There's there's good brand exercises to do. I mean, you might say, well, we just paid you know, a lot of money to have our brand done last year. Well, that, that's great. You've, you've got a way to articulate that. But it also gets down to the fact of being able to articulate that internally. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of times it's even just the matter of, of having conversations to find out, um, you know, what, what does everybody, why are they even there? Why, why are the teachers there? Why, why do they teach there? A lot of them have been there for years and years and years. What drives their passion? You know, mm -hmm. what are the 50 questions people ask? Sometimes that right there can start to help you craft content, craft messaging, craft a lot of things, because you're starting to answer the questions that the people are asking uh, that can help you kind of identify your values, help you identify your positioning statement and some of the other, you know, what's, what's considered branding. But at the end of the day, I mean, you've really got to build those relationships and talk about it and have conversations about it because you can't just whip it up in the lab. You know, you can't go back with your marketing team mm -hmm. or, um, or a, a, you know, a partner agency and just dream something up and then roll it out to the world. It's, it's really got to be authentic and you've got to understand it, but um, it has to be driven out of just some, some deep seated emotion. I always talk about how a good brand needs to be relevant. It has to mean something. It has to be something that resonates. That's something that responds to a need that people have. It has to be authentic. It has to be mm -hmm. true. You can't tell people you're going to have X experience and then get to campus and that's not the experience that you right. have. And it has to be distinctive. If it's not distinctive in the marketplace, then you just blend in with all the other 4,000 mm -hmm. schools in the country. And I think that's the trick. Like when you're talking about, you know, sitting with um, an agency partner, you can dream up anything as a brand, oh, yeah. anything. But if it's not those th three things, it's not going to work. No. And if it's two of those three things, it's not going to work. Right. I mean, yeah, you look at a recent example in the in the larger public. I mean, Snoop Dogg and Solo Stove. I mean, very creative. Right. Well done. You could argue that it's relevant. I mean, they you know, the messaging was relevant. 
but man, they struck out. <laughs> and, I, and I think that they missed one of the three. Yeah. And um, it's just, I mean, it's it's a kind of a comical example. And it, some people might say, well, that doesn't apply to me. Well, sometimes it might, because mm-hmm. I think that, you know, we can go down some paths and kind of get a little bit, you know, narrow minded in the way we're looking at it, or that's the way we've always done it, or that's just what we, that's what the president wants. And we miss one of those three elements and, and that we're just in the same boat. Well, I think too, we also think, well, this is what students want. So this is what we're going to say we have. Yes. That's the biggest mistake in the world. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think you have to understand what your students want in order to get that relevant piece, right? Mm -hmm. Like what, what are they looking for? But if they want X and you don't have X, don't tell them you have X. No, because that's the worst thing that you can do. Yes. And the word of mouth will kill you. Yeah. That, that's one of the things that, um, you know, you talked earlier about a, a lot of apps, you know, mm-hmm. and, and the, the school I kind of walked into where they were, you know, really reliant on those big apps and, you know, the big companies that are going to generate all the apps and I, they wanted a different approach. And so I came in with the idea of, of, you know, really trying to focus in on the mission fit students. And because part of the problems that they had, and I mean, this is again, going back to a lot of my clients are, are faith-based schools. They were getting a lot of athletes. They were getting a lot of students coming in because a lot of the smaller schools rely on athletics to come in and, you know, kids want to play college ball. Mm -hmm. And so they would get there and like week one, you know, they're like, chapel, what are you talking about? Man, you guys take this Jesus thing serious. What's this about? (laughs) And it's like, and and they were like, why are we having that problem? I'm like, because you are just pulling everybody and anybody in and you're not telling who you really are at the Mm -hmm. beginning. And it would serve you better and the student better if you were just clear with this is who we are and go after that because then your yield is going to go up really fast and you're not going to have this retention problem and all the other issues that come along with it. And it's, it's better to not, you know, not please everybody and, and maybe kind of steer some people away and just like, that's not what I want. I I could never stand that kind of school. Fine. That's okay. We don't have to be everything to everybody, but we have to be something to the people that matter. Yeah. If we're all alike and we're all everything to everybody or whatever, we might as well be one university with a bunch of branch campuses all over the country. Exactly. Exactly. And we're not. We we all serve different niches. All serve different niches. And I think the sooner that we can all understand that, I think the better students will be because mm-hmm. I think they'll be they'll understand that's that's what that's what I'm at about over there. I want that. So Yeah. I wish every school would get this because honestly, I feel like we would be able to spend less on marketing, which it feels weird to be a CMO (laughs) being like, we can spend less on marketing. But if you just know who you are, who your student is, and you're, everybody's in that position where they all know who they are and who their student is, you're competing with a, a pool of schools that are similar to you, maybe geographically different or whatever, but there's, there's much more distinctiveness. Instead, it's like always kids sitting under trees with backpacks and mm-hmm. it's about belonging and that's it's about you know an Small excellent class education sizes and- yes. <laughs> excellent education by dedicated faculty in an inspiring environment exactly uh, exactly i could throw up over every one of those i see oh yep you know that goes hand in hand in hand with the uh, best kept secret mm-hmm. message exactly it does it does yeah there's one case study in your book that I, I would love to talk about. I was super inspired by it. I, I've done some, played with something similar, but I'm completely stealing this idea and told my team that yesterday. <laughs> talk to me about what you did with this, this dog story or this pet story. Yeah. So that was a, uh, it's an interesting story because I was on the receiving end as a parent. So, you know, I've got, uh, I've got four kids that are all Gen Z right now, they range in age from 24 down to 18. And so, you know, we've done the entire college thing with all of them. And, uh, my son had applied to seven schools. He was our oldest. And, uh, on the fly, he decided he would pl- apply to Butler university here in Indianapolis. He wanted to do photojournalism and, and, uh, they had a really strong journalism program, you know, went through everything. He was, he was doing fine. One day he got a letter in the mail. I got two letters in the mail. One was addressed to Tigger Kaler and the other one was addressed to Stormy Kaler. And Tigger was our dog and Stormy is our cat. Each one was a little different. Tigger's uh, envelope had a, had a bone on it and Stormy's had a ball of yarn on it. And so he wasn't home yet. And all of us were like, what in the world is this? <laughs> Who is sending mail to our pets? <laughs> And so he got home and we're like, everybody's gathered around. And there's six of us gathered around him opening these up. And so we opened it up and there's this, you know, there's a personalized card from 
the the butler dog named Blue. And it's very cleverly written. It's it's like, you know, dear Tigger, I just wanted to let you know, you know, how proud I am of your human for getting you know accepted to Butler University. And he had already received his acceptance letter. So this was after the fact. And I just want to let you know that when they arrive on campus, I will guard him as if he's my own mm. human. And, you know, just a really dog to dog type of thing yeah. and included a bandana for the dog. And, but the cat one was different. It's, it was almost <laughs> like, you know, I understand we don't always get along and I respect you. And, and so it was that kind of tone of voice and a smaller bandana for the cat. And the first thing he did was put him on his dog and put him on his cat. And I could tell at that moment, that's where he was going to go to school because they took the time on the common app to ask one extra question. They had yep. the option of asking the extra questions. It's like, please give us, do you have any pets? Yes or no. Give us the name and the type of pet that they are. They had that plan from the very beginning. And they even go to the level that if you live locally in Indianapolis, they'll actually send Blue out in the Butler Blue van with his handler. And they have a special bone that has the, the acceptance letter in it. They'll go up and ring your doorbell and Blue will actually deliver your acceptance letter and take pictures with you to put on social media. And so it's a very clever way to leverage something that you have, mm -hmm. something that you're known for, but to do it in an ultra creative way. The author of that, Christy, was on one of my podcasts and we talked about that. It was one of the early podcasts. And, you know, she she was the writer of that and, and was the kind of the one who came up with it. And it's just such a brilliant campaign. I've seen it, you know, duplicated a few times now, but it's okay because it's such a great, great campaign. And it gets the attention and I think it's authentic and it hits Generation Z in a place where you listen to them, you you see them, you hear them. And that's it's one of the big things that they're all about. I absolutely love that. I, so I told our AVP for enrollment management that I, she needs to figure out how to add a field to the app for next year because I, I want to do that. And we did something similar at a previous institution and, and we had it be like bark, 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 and then parenthetically under it. It was like what the message is and then like bark, bark, bark. Like, <laughs> That's great. You I know, so that. that it was like, you know, read it to the dog, bark, 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 and then <laughs> the owner knows what it what it's saying. And it I think it's such opportunity for like a social media play because mm -hmm. who's not going to post that on social media? Oh, yeah. Who's not going to take a picture of their dog in the band bandana? It's, it's a whole lot easier than asking somebody to hold up a sign that says, you know, I got in hashtag or whatever. So, yeah. Yeah. I love it. So and it would not be prudent of me to have Bartlett Kaler on my podcast and not talk a little bit about future trends and assume that you're going to talk about AI. <laughs> oh, we've talked enough, haven't we? <laughs> so, so Bart, um, what future trends do you see? How do you think AI is going to change marketing in higher ed? You know, without going into details about the the, the nuts and bolts of it, I, I will just say, you know, I've, I've interviewed Guy Kawasaki on the website and, you know, he was the chief evangelist at Apple during the 80s when the personal computer was coming on. And I asked him about AI and he said, you know, what I think about AI is that it's bigger than the personal computer. It's bigger than the internet. It's bigger than social media combined. And I think a lot of people haven't figured that out yet. I mean, you and I've talked about it and I think we see that. I even did a, a webinar this afternoon um, on AI and I had a lot of people, you know, text me or message me later saying, I didn't realize that chat GPT could do as much as what you showed us today. I mean, I think most people get on chat GPT, get the free account and, you know, write me a FAFSA blog. And it's like, huh, this isn't that great. What's the big deal about all this without understanding all the other things that, that you and I've learned. And, and so I think that AI is going to continue to grow. And, and I think that with chat GPT five coming out this year, I think I, I read the other day that with Apple's new uh, upgrade to their iOS, it's going to include a new Siri that's going to basically be chat GPT esque. Mm. And so you'll be able to talk with Siri like you do, you know, chat GPT and it'll wow. blow, blow up. I mean, imagine what you could do with yeah. having an agent like that on your phone. And so I think we're going to just see a ton of things happen extremely fast. I mean, I thought last year, a lot happened fast between July and December. And I think that that's already started. I mean, the deep fakes, I mean, I did a deep fake on LinkedIn. I don't know if you saw that, but I, I did a deep fake of myself and uh, you couldn't tell. I mean, I still have people on my team who watched it and they're like, okay, you talk about a video. When's, when are you going to show the video? I'm like, that was the video. <laughs> <laughs> it was bonkers. Yeah. And, um, and I, you know, I get worried about the deep fakes and just in our political environment and everything yeah. else. And I don't want to get into that, but 
even since then, I, I made a prediction that this was the first week of January. I said, by the end of the January, we're going to start seeing it in the news. And by March, we're going to see a school having to deal with something in a major crisis because somebody had the president say something or somebody had a famous alumni say something about the school. And even today, there were already some other deep fakes that I heard CNN talking about, you know, on my way to this podcast. So what I believe is going to happen is that with AI going bonkers and schools trying to figure out what that means for them, because every business is trying to figure that out. The enrollment cliff is coming like a freight train, mm-hmm. and a lot of schools are still kind of not quite sure how they're handling that or what they're going to do. I think you're going to see an increased perception of mistrust in higher education, and I think that's only going to get exasperated with our political climate. And I think what's going to happen is all this is going to come to a head in the next six to 18 months to the point where change management is going to become almost unbearable for probably a lot of our boomer uh, leadership, because Mm -hmm. a lot of them are going to be like, I think I'm going to take that gig that this, you know, that I've been offered to go off and consult because it's not worth it for me to be in the midst of this chaos anymore. And I think what's the bigger issue that I think in the midst of all this is we're going to have a vacuum of leadership in the next 18 months to three years where a lot of board members are going to say it's not worth it anymore. They're going to retire. A lot of senior leadership are going to say, I'd rather be playing golf right now. And you're going to have a lot of Xers and a lot of millennials kind of being cast and thrust into senior leadership roles uh, that need to be hopefully literate enough in AI in the enrollment cliff and enrollment marketing and digital marketing and those things that can turn the ship around in a quick way. That's what concerns me more. I mean, AI is going to be a big driver of that. And I believe that AI has the answers to that because as you and I both know, the more you use AI, the more that you can leverage it, the more you can do, and the more that you can solve problems faster. Kind of like what I illustrated earlier about ask chat GPT about what you need to ask your digital marketing agency. Yeah, It's those things like that, that you don't need to hire another person to go figure out a problem. You could have a team of people through chat GPTs or just custom GPTs. Now you can create an army to do specific tasks. And so I think we're going to see a lot more of the people who understand how to use AI that are going to all of a sudden you're going to look at them and you're going to be like, how is that school doing that? Mm-hmm. I, and and then you're going to see the other ones. It's like, wow, I thought they had a lot more together than, than what it seems like. And I think the ones who are going to be able to manage the change are the ones who are going to understand the tools that they have at their disposal and they're going to lean into it. That is so smart. And I love that you didn't just talk about what AI can do for marketers, but that you talked about sort of the real world implications of what that's going to do to our leadership. Like I hadn't really thought about it like that and thought about it takes a lot of effort to stay up on developments. And I think that there's, you're right, there's challenges for for people who are already there in leadership. They're kind of tired of having to stay caught up on everything. And I'm not trying to be disparaged because it just takes to, I mean, they've got a lot of things that they're trying to balance already. Yeah. This is just, I think, going to be the straw that breaks the camel's back. Yeah, it is it is really hard to stay on top of it. But I was having a conversation the other day with um, one of my staff and was talking about, you know, I did this, this, and this thing. And I was like, and that was before chat GPT, so I couldn't like brainstorm with a robot, <laughs> you know? Exactly. And, and the person was like, wait a second, you're right. We didn't have chat GPT the summer before last. Like, <laughs> yeah. we've only had it for a little over a year. Yeah. Like what in the world? It's kind of mind blowing to think about a tool that we use constantly. Mm-hmm. And I have one team member. She uses she's using it to like figure out directory structures and oh, yeah. I mean all kinds of stuff. I love that for her. I love I, that she's like exploring how she can make her job easier. Yeah, I, I did a um uh for for one of the uh, the conferences I'm going to shortly they're doing a tribute video for someone who passed away and they asked me to help out with it and so they had about you know 10 different presidents send in a, a video about this person and so I needed to get it done for next week and I, I was the one who said yeah I'll be happy to do that and you know thinking I'm just going to whip it out and I was like okay there's like 10 videos here each person talks for 4 to 6 minutes 
I don't know how to put this together in a story because I needed to be able to show pictures and, you know, the classic Ken Burns type of effect. I'm not a videographer or a video producer. I mean, I was going to use Camtasia. I mean, that's just as simple as it was going to get for me. And I thought, what if I put all this in chat GPT? So I uploaded all the videos into Loom and Loom now produces transcripts on the fly using AI. So I downloaded the transcripts and put them in a Google Doc. I put the person's name at the beginning of each transcript, and then I copied the entire thing and threw it into chat GPT. And I gave it a prompt to say, I'm putting together a video. I need you to act as a video editor, put together a script and pull out the best quotes from these, these testimonials and weave it together in a series of, of a story about this person. And I gave a background and two seconds later, I had the video script with the timestamps. I asked it to put the timestamps of the video in. So I pulled the videos in had my script there that chat GPT did and started editing it based on that script and it turned out pretty well. I am amazed by that. And I love that. I love that. And, and, and to circle back to your deep vape, I've shown that to multiple people as like a, this is where we are today. This is not like some far distant future. Bart made this today and showed it to people and they just kept being like, like your staff. Wait, what? When's the video going to show? Like, no, what, what's he it. talking about? It's like, no, that's it. That, that is a puppet. <laughs> right. That is not Bart. That is yeah. a, a fake Bart. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, it, it is kind of crazy. I could talk to you all night, Bart, but, um, you know, people probably... Uh, I need to get back in to try some yeah. things on chat GPT. <laughs> yeah, right. Or read my book, either one. <laughs> right. One of the two. We need to free up people's time for that. Um, but where can people find you? They can find me on LinkedIn. That's probably the best place. Uh, I'm probably the only Bart Kaler out there, C-A-Y-L-O-R. And, uh, and, and you can also find me at kaler-solutions.com. That's my website or the Higher Ed Marketer podcast. Those are kind of the three main areas that I'm in and always happy to connect on LinkedIn and talk with, with folks. So looking forward to it. Yeah. Follow, follow Bart on LinkedIn. He has lots of great tips and that's a place where I go first to kind of see, you know, what, what is new with mm -hmm. chat GPT? Like, let's see what Bart's talking about. <laughs> and, and I, that's because I follow other people to see what they're talking about. Right, so. right. And that's really where we are right now with this technology. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's, there's not an expert. I, in fact, I got asked to, to teach a class on chat GPT for a, for a graduate level school. And I mean, there's no textbooks, there's nothing out there. I, I, I got approached by someone who's writing a textbook to ask if I would write the intro for it. And I said, when's this going to be out? And she said, uh, we're looking at the fall of 25. I'm like, wow, how are you going to write a textbook on AI marketing for the fall of 25? <laughs> oh my gosh. So, wow. but that's what, that's what the rigor requires for textbooks. And it's yeah. like, uh, we got to rethink that. So that's, I feel like that's going to be the equivalent of like teaching about MySpace in, in 2018 or something. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Oh, so, wow. A lot of fun things. Awesome. Well, well, listeners, as always, you know where you can find me. I am on LinkedIn at Jamie Hunt. I'm on X a little bit, uh, J-A-I-M-E-H-U-N-T-I-M-C. Um, and my website is The Higher Ed CMO. I'm also dabbling a little bit with TikTok, but it kind of comes and goes. My husband's setting up a nice little studio for me, uh, a, a home office. So hopefully soon I'll be doing more there. But thanks as always for listening. Thank you, Bart, for being on the show. And let's go bust some silos. Confessions of a Higher Ed CMO is part of the Enrollify Podcast Network. If you like this podcast, chances are you'll like other Enrollify shows too. Our podcast network is growing by the month. And we've got a plethora of marketing, enrollment, and higher ed technology shows that are jam-packed with stories, ideas, and frameworks, all designed to empower you to be a better higher ed professional. Our shows help higher ed marketers and admissions professionals find their next big idea and feature a selection of the industry best as your host. Learn from Mallory Wilsey, Seth O'Dell, Jenny Lee Fowler, Eddie Francis, and so many other of your favorite leaders in higher ed. Enrollify is made possible by Element 451, the leading AI-powered all-in-one student engagement platform, helping institutions create meaningful, personalized, and engaging interactions with students. Learn more at element451.com.